Hi, everyone. My name is Ted Kortler. I'm a field CTO here at Data Robot, where I support our customers when they're deploying machine learning models. And I'll let Alex, my colleague, introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Thermos. I'm a customer facing data scientist here at Data Robot. So I support customers with actually uh, building, integrating, and using Data Robot uh, in production scenarios. Awesome. So let's go ahead and jump into today's topic where we're talking about a canonical AI stack and really what makes it different from other traditional stacks. And we'll even show you an example of what a canonical AI stack actually is. Yeah. Yep. So today we'll talk about how do we get into kind of the messy state of the industry right now um, and what's different about that stack. And like I said, we'll talk about a demonstration as well. But first, let's talk about Data Robot on the next slide. Data Robot has been around for 10 years. We've had over a billion dollars invested. And I'm proud to say we've served over a billion predictions across 20,000 deployed models in thousands of our customers. We helped really create the auto ML category. And certainly we, we've learned a lot about applied and productionalized machine learning in that time frame. But let's now transition on the next slide to what have we, what can we learn from technology stacks? Well, in 1998, the LAMP stack was considered best in class. Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And that was the way you would deploy a uh, web page, right? And that lasted for about 15 years. It's still widely used today. But now we have the mean stack, Mongo, uh, which is a document database, uh, Express, Angular, and Node. And then even a few years later, the Jam stack came out, where it's JavaScript, APIs, and markup. But that, what we can learn from that type of transition is that as an industry starts to mature, uh, the technical um, aspects, the um, uh, considerations actually get abstracted away and you get more scalability, simpler interaction, and more capabilities. And unfortunately, machine learning has not followed this so far, but we hope that it will be, and that's what we're here to talk about today. The reason that this is the case is because the traditional data scientist has always cared about model development first. And you actually don't need infrastructure for that. You can build a model on your local laptop and you don't really have to worry about anything else. You really just need to focus on model development. But in order to get a, a um, model into production, you actually have to start focusing on a lot of the infrastructure, which is why it's always been an afterthought. So on the next slide, this is a real technology stack from archive.org, and it's kind of messy. You have data scientists, business analysts, uh, data engineers, DevOps, uh, ML engineers, all on this diagram, right? So you have a lot of parties. You also have a lot of functionality, and you have things like the experimentation. You have things like AutoML. You have notebooks. You have lots of registries, lots of databases, lots of work, throw, work processes and data movement in order to put a model into production and be consumed. This is messy. This is part of the problem of our industry of why models get built, but rarely deployed. So let's now think about, <clears throat> let's now think about on the next slide, what broadly conceptually do we actually need well, we actually need data management. And data management really is around what's the enterprise data warehouse. And within that data warehouse, you need a system of record. You need an actual feature store. And that can take many different forms. Uh, but essentially, you need variables that the, the enterprise is comfortable using in machine learning. And that's really what a feature store is. From there, the next functional requirement that you need for a, a real AI stack is model development. And a model, uh, the mo model development process would have feature engineering, uh, code versioning, experiment tracking, and of course, the ML training aspect. So you, what algorithms can you use? What tuning parameters can you use? And so on. And this is very iterative. And that iteration is much different than what you saw in a web stack. Um, on, on the next slide, what you'll actually get to is you'll try many different models and eventually a model gets selected and you want to put it into production. So that requires an, an ML ops layer. And that's really the beginning of this consumption layer. 
And again, you'll need more version control, more active monitoring, more governance in regulated industries. You'll need orchestration. But eventually these models start to deteriorate. And if they start to deteriorate, you'll need to retrain a model. And that kicks it back to that middle pinwheel. And it's this kind of infinity loop that we see on the next slide that actually makes the ML development stack different than the other development stacks, uh, the other technology stacks. And so really this boils down to, you need to have an architecture for your information management and another architecture for these uh, kind of infinity loop that we call a prototyping loop. And that is why uh, these are difficult to put into production. Now, if we flatten this workflow, right, and we think about it more linearly, kind of as just phase gates in a work process. <clears throat> Alex, yeah, you'll see you need a data warehouse. You need um, the feature store. You'll need your uh, model training and your model evaluation. And that's kind of where it goes back and forth. Uh, then you have this model operations, that's where models get exposed to the consumption layer. You need governance to understand that, you need blueprints, and so on. And from there, all of this is happening in an organized and tracked, and there's a lot going on in the experiment tracking uh, methodologies. So if you click one forward, Alex, you'll see in this workflow, you'll see where I think Data Robot fits in and where this prototyping loop actually happens. And finally, on this last slide, uh, before we jump over to the demonstration, you'll see an actual architectural diagram. So this is just an example. There are many different ways to do this, but I want people to think about the universal here. You have data on the left side, a feature store, which is your system of record for what can be used in models, both in production and in model training. You'll have some sort of notebook environment allowing you to do rapid experimentation. And you'll want a, an ML ops layer that allows you to inherit legacy models, auto ML models, hand coded models, and otherwise. And the thing to focus on is that the prototyping loop that happens in the middle, that's universal. That standardizes for the enterprise. And no matter what the consumption layer is, whether that's uh, deploying to the edge, whether that's a data table write back, whether that's going into a dashboard, it doesn't matter. You want the prototyping engine to turn that flywheel fast so you can get to good outcomes. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Alex so that he can actually do the demo. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you, Ted. Uh, like I said, my name is Alex Thermos. I'm a customer facing data scientist at Data Robot. And what I'd like to show you today is the prototyping loop within our AI stack. So what this will primarily demonstrate is going all the way from data to model and then finally using that model in a production grade scenario. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna start in Databricks as we showed in an earlier slide. We're gonna use Databricks as both our data ingestion and our feature store. Then we're gonna use M Data Robot as our core ML experimentation engine, as well as our ML ops platform of choice to deploy, monitor, and manage models. And so the first question we wanna ask ourselves is who does this cater to? So Who's actually going to be doing this, actually be able to do this AI and ML work? And the answer is we have two primary types of users in mind. Less technical users, so maybe an advanced business analyst who wants to use like a graphic user interface. And then we have more technical users. These are like the hardcore data scientists who want to code from end to end. I'm going to show both tracks in parallel and demonstrate how using this stack to make AI more broadly available to a wider audience within your organization. So that's one of the mass benefits of using a stack like this, is more people can get in the game and actually build AI and ML projects. And so the final question is, what is the benefit here? Why are we doing this? Why bother with this technical stack at all? And as Ted touched on earlier, the short answer is abstraction and automation. So you saw that messy diagram that Ted showed earlier with all those different components. We're trying to abstract and automate away all of that messiness to create a simplified, unified, easy to use AI and ML tech stack available for a wide variety of users. And so hopefully the benefits of this tech stack will become clear during our demonstration. And so without further ado, I will begin our demonstration 
building a project from start to finish, uh, primarily demonstrating that center portion of our technical stack. So I'm going to pop open our Databricks notebook. And this is where we're going to be, where we're going to be doing our development. And the first thing I'm going to do is just read in libraries as I normally would for any other data science project. So I'm just going to read in some standard uh, data science libraries. And the first thing I'm going to do is read in the data. Okay. And so this is data stored in files that I've stored in our Databricks file system. And so I'm going to read in this data. This is just going to take a second to run here. And so now we've read in our data. And now I can take a look at this data. And so this data is about employees in our company and whether or not they've left the company within the last year. We want to use this data to predict who is going to leave the company in the future. So you can see various attributes about different people. So we have their employee ID number. Uh, we have attrition. This is whether or not they left, ended up leaving the company. This is our target variable. This is what we're trying to predict. We have age, whether they travel, how much they're getting paid, uh, various results of surveys, so how, how uh, engaged they feel, their job involvement, satisfaction, marital status. These are just all really good attributes to predict whether or not someone's going to leave the company. We even have a full text review all the way on the right uh, from presumably a manager on how this person is performing. So now that we've read in the data, we're going to move down and we're going to go to the next step in the process. And we're going to perform some quick exploratory data analysis, some EDA. So what we want to do is we just want to get a feel for the data. We want to explore the data, understand the data, just get a general vibe for what's going on in the data generally. So I'm going to run this out. And right now we're just looking at the attrition column. We're looking at counts of the attrition column, how many people left the company versus how many people stayed at the company. It looks like a majority of the people actually stayed at the company, about 4,000 people and about a thousand people left the company. So this is what we're gonna tr try to predict on. We're trying to predict who is going to leave the company. So these are the individuals that we're trying to actually predict. So after we've done some exploratory data analysis, we've got to feel for our data. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do feature engineering. <clears throat> and this is where Databricks really shines. So you can do all of your feature engineering directly in the notebook, you can even write back to Databricks and use Databricks as a feature store. And it's really easy to use, really simple, really fast, really powerful. Um, this data set's pretty clean, doesn't require a ton of feature engineering. So I just have a few lines of code just demonstrating what this would look like. But if you had a lot of features to engineer, a lot of work to do here, this could easily extend to multiple lines of code, multiple cells, and you could do all of your feature engineering at this point in the workflow. Now, note, we are going to be using Data Robot as our ML experimentation engine on the line. And so, Data Robot is going to automate away a lot of the feature engineering that we would have ordinarily done. Things like numerical, categorical embeddings, one hot encoding, missing value imputation, all of that is going to be abstracted away by Data Robot. We don't have to do any of that. The feature engineering that you're going to want to do here is business specific feature engineering. So things that human intuition requires to understand about a problem, uh, those are the features that we need to engineer. Things that uh, a human would realize are important to this specific problem. We don't have to do all that other numeric type feature engineering in this uh, cell. So now that we've done our feature engineering, we've ingested our data, we've done our EDA, we've done feature engineering, now we're ready to actually begin building machine learning models. And we are going to use, as we mentioned earlier, Data Robot as our ML experimentation engine in order to do this. So the first thing we're going to do is connect Data Robot with an API endpoint. So I'm just going to connect Data Robot here. So now we're connected. And the next thing we're going to do is create a Data Robot project and train models with Autopilot. So if you've done this manually, what you've probably done is you've used model.fit you fit one model, maybe you fit a couple models in your workflow, and um, it takes a considerable amount of time, and you've, you've done things that way, and you build about one or two or three models. Data Robot is going to use dr.project.create to build dozens of machine learning models in parallel automatically and automatically find the best 
terraforming model for you. And so that's what we're going to use. We're going to use Data Robot to abstract and automate a lot of this work away that a data scientist would have done ordinarily. So I'm going to run the cell. And this is going to kick off my product in Data Robot. So we're just going to give this a couple seconds to warm up here. And so now this project should be running in Data Robot. And so now, if I go over to the Data Robot user interface and I go here, you can now see this work begin to kick off in Data Robot in our status bar on the right. You can see we're uploading data. We're going to read in our raw data. We're going to begin our exploratory analysis. And then we're going to start building machine learning models using autopilot. Now, this is going to take some time. So I'm going to come back to this in a second. And we're going to skip ahead a little bit in our notebook. So let's say we've built all of our projects or all of our models in Data Robot. We've built all these models. They're finished. They're done. They're ready to go. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to want to dig into the models begin interpreting, explaining, and understand our models. We just want to get an understanding of what these models are doing, how they're performing, and generally what's going on with these models, what's driving these models. These are where our two paths really begin to diverge. If you remember I mentioned earlier, there's that less technical path, a user interface path for a less technical user, and there's that more technical path for hardcore data scientists who just want to write code. So if I want to begin interpreting and understanding these models, I can do this all via code here. So I'm going to kill this real quick. I'm going to get a finished project that's already done. And I can begin looking at some exploratory data analysis. I can look at my top performing models on the leaderboard. So here's my top performing models. I can look at their AUC. I can plot things like ROC curve. I can plot feature impact. I can see what my key drivers of the model are. I can do all of this directly via code itself. Or if I want to take the less technical route, I don't want to write this code. I can go back to Data Robot and I can begin doing this exploration in Data Robot itself. And so this is a lot easier, a lot more intuitive, um, a lot less code to write. So I'm actually going to use the user interface for this portion. I'm going to go the less technical route just because it's easier to follow, easier to interpret, and easier to understand. Now, jumping back a little bit, you remember we kicked off autopilot. We started building those models. You can now see those models being built on the right-hand side. So we have our workers on the top right. These, this is our pool of compute resources, OK? I have 20 workers. Each worker gets a model. And these workers are now churning away, building dozens of machine learning models in parallel at the same time, automatically competing these models against each other, stack ranking them by their performance, and the best performing models are then going to wind up on our model leaderboard. And this is our model leaderboard. This is what it looks like when it's all set and done and these machine learning models have finished running. And then skipping ahead again, now we can begin interpreting, understanding, and evaluating these models, just getting a feel for what's going on in these models. And the first place I'm going to start to do this is the blueprint. And so the blueprint is the, the process that this model is going through in order to generate our prediction. It's both, as I mentioned earlier, pre-processing and feature engineering steps that are, being, that are being automated away in order to generate a prediction. So we can see ordinal encoding happening here. We can see missing value imputation. We can see we're doing some uh, some some NRAM, uh, analysis on some text features we have. So this is all the work that's being automated away by the data robot model. Then we can begin digging into uh, model performance, various things of this nature. So I can look at a lift chart. These are our values, our predicted and actual values, binned lowest to highest to see how they track together. And right now, it looks like our model's performing really well, pretty well. So the, the predicted and actuals are tracking pretty close together. This is a pretty good performing machine learning model. I can look at ROC curves. So this is you know, our prediction distribution, our ROC curve, our confusion matrix, beginning to dig into how this model's performing. And then I can look at feature impact. So feature impact. Are, these are the key drivers of our model. These are the most important factors 
in what is determining whether or not someone's going to leave the company or not. So our most important factor is someone's job role, what job they're actually working in, followed by their hourly pay, and then how much overtime they're working. So these are the most important things to predict whether or not someone is going to leave or not. And this is actually pretty insightful. Now we have a good understanding of what is going on under the hood of this machine learning model. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but these are just a few of the interpretability and understanding tools get using a tool like Data Roll out of the box. So now we've built our machine learning model. We've gone all the way from data through EDA to feature engineering. We've kicked off a project in Data Robot. We've built dozens of machine learning models. We found a model that we like, and now we're ready to deploy this model. Again, going back to those two technical tracks, that less technical track, that user interface focused track, and that more technical code first track, I'm gonna go to the less technical track right now. So let's say I wanna deploy this model in production and begin using it. To do that, I'm going to go to the predict tab. I'm going to go to deploy. I'm going to choose my prediction threshold. I'm going to set up a new deployment. I'm going to call this um, dummy deployment. I'm going to flip a couple settings here. I'm going to click create a deployment. I'm going to choose my importance. Then boom. I'm going to click create a deployment. My deployment is now being created. My model is going into production. No complicated technical overhead, no complicated coding frameworks, just, just a simple click of a button and my model is now deployed in production. So going back to that more technical track, okay? So I'm going to go back to my code notebook. Now we explored all these models here. If I want to go to the more technical track and I want to deploy this model using code, I'm going to grab my top model. So I'm, I'm first going to grab my project. I'm going to grab my top model. And to do this same process in code, I'm going to write just a few lines of code here. I'm going to run this cell. And this is going to deploy my model in production uh, using code. So same process, same thing happened in the user interface in this first environment. Now I have deployed my model in production. My model is ready to use. So my model in production now, it's ready to use in a real life scenario. So what's next? Now we want to score the model using real data that's coming in, real data that's coming into the business, and we want to generate predictions uh, using this data. So that's the final step in our process is actually generating these predictions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go down here, I'm gonna get my testing data, and I'm gonna hit that deployment using the Data Robot API endpoint. So this is gonna go call out to Data Robot to get those predictions. And then boom, my predictions come back. I've got all my predictions and I can store these predictions in Databricks. I can run them through another model. I can do whatever I want. I have my predictions now and I can use these predictions to generate value for my business. And if I go to my deployment here, so if I go to my code, my deployment was called Rework API Demo. I'm gonna search for this in my ML Ops dashboard. So these are all my deployments. I'm gonna search for that deployment I just created. Here's my deployment. And if I go to Service Health, you can see that I've hit this deployment with 740 prediction requests. And if I go here and I run this cell again, so let me run this again, let me hit that API again. This is just gonna take a second here. Got more predictions back. If I refresh this page, now I have just over a thousand predictions that I've generated, okay? So this is this deployment running in real time, serving predictions. So now everything's up and running. Everything's working. We've gone end to end using Databricks as a, fee, uh, a data ingestion engine feature store, all the way to Data Robot for our model experimentation, explainability, understanding, and then ML Ops. There's just a few more tools that I want to show you that you get in ML Ops that are really, really beneficial uh, to your business. So I'm going to go over to another deployment here. You get Service Health. So this is basically telling you, is the model running? Is it serving predictions in a timely fashion? Is everything up and running and running smoothly? You get data drift. So this is gonna tell you, 
is our data drifting? Did it change from what we trained the model on to what's actually being run through the model now? So if something like COVID happens, a lot of data can drift pretty significantly. We want to know if that's happening. And then accuracy. So accuracy is basically telling us how is our model performing in a live scenario? Is it generating predictions accurately and is it performing well? And we can see this accuracy down below. Two other things that you get out of the box that are really, really beneficial through Data Robot are champion challenger analysis. So we deployed our model, that's our champion model, but are there other models out there that are performing better than a champion model? That's what champion challenger is. So we can see, are there other modeling approaches that are performing better? We can instantly see that down below. And if we see some other model performing better, we can do a hot swap of these models right here and swap out our champion model and replace that with one of our challengers. And then finally, uh, continuous retraining. So I can set up a retraining policy here and automatically retrain my model on the freshest data every day, every week, every hour. I can do it if accuracy starts to degrade or I can do it if data starts to drift automatically without any need for manual intervention. So I simply set up one of these policies and this, will, this is closing the entire loop of the ML lifecycle. This net model is now being trained on the freshest data automatically. So with that, we appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully that shares what the AI stack could look like.